you have your Bibles uh, with me this morning, a good place to land would be 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Admittedly, we're going to skip around a little bit today. We'll be back in 2 Corinthians next week. I backed up early this week and kind of punted a little bit. Uh, I pushed back the message I was going to share this morning to next week, so you'll have to come back for that. This morning, I just have kind of had something on my heart. It's kind of been brewing for a while, and I felt like this was the, this was the time to share it. And it's amazing how God kind of puts things together. I think all three of the songs that we sang this morning really brought out uh, some scriptural truths about the power and the sovereignty of God, uh, the holiness of our Lord. And uh, I think we never need to lose sight of the fact that our God is true and faithful and, and what God says goes. What God says goes, and we, uh, as much as, as we try to sometimes, I think even as believers, we catch ourselves in this sometimes. We, 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 uh, it's easy to get into a watered-down gospel. It's easy to try to make uh, God say what we want Him to say rather than uh, counting from Genesis to Revelation what He says as true and and it's unchanging. He, he is beginning and end. He is Alpha and Omega. God always has been, always will be. Our God is God, and He is the great I Am, and He's totally in control, and we need to never lose sight of that. And that's been on my heart. I just want to submit this morning, I'm not, a very, I'm, I'm not very good at topical preaching. I, I, in fact, I don't really, over the long haul, I don't believe in it. That's why, as a church, we have walked through a in nearly 20 years, we have, <laughs> we've covered a lot. We've covered nearly the whole Bible. We have walked through books of the Bible uh, over and over. Y'all remember that one year and a half we spent in the book of Romans? Y'all remember that? Like, you know, we do that kind of stuff. And so uh, to, to jump out of it is, gets out of my comfort zone a little bit, just to be honest. Um, and, and so I don't ever want to just, and that's why I think I held off on this a little bit. I don't ever want to be I don't want to just conjure up some topic and then try to make everything fit what I want it to say. I want to make sure we're being uh, grounded from the Scripture, if that makes sense. And so I, I just want to start here, and I will submit to you what, what I take from this for us a walk away today is to say that what we believe matters. What we believe matters. Uh, 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17 I think is a good place to start. Look at this. It, this is familiar Scripture. And it's Scripture talking about itself. This is what's interesting. This is, this is what we see. It says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, which means disapproval. In other words, the, the, the Word of God is valuable in the sense that it tells us, not only does it tell us what we should be doing, but it tells us a lot of what shouldn't be happening and what shouldn't take place. So it's good for reproof. It's good for correction. It's good for training in righteousness. In other words, it, the more we know of God's Word and what it says, the more we're able to grow in our faith with the Lord. We're able to grow to, to, uh, in maturity in our faith. And it's, it gives us the why in verse 17, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. We know we're not saved by good works, but we also know as believers that once we are saved... This is telling us that the more we're in the Word and the more the Word is valuable to us, it helps us in those good works, those things that ought to be coming out in our lives that prove that our salvation is real. In other words, Christians, none of us ever got saved by good works, but good works are a part or a result of being saved. I would submit to you this morning this, that, that many people, I think you would probably agree with me, that many people are convinced that it does not matter what you believe. This is what we see in our world around us. It, it's even happening in churches, some places, that, that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Um, but I just want to tell you this morning, the, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that. You can search it from Genesis to Revelation, and you will never find that in the Scripture. The Bible is very clear that our eternity hinges on what we believe. What, what you and I believe matters. The Bible never says that... What you believe doesn't matter. Um, I was driving down the interstate last night. We were coming back from Huntsville, and, and I just kind of had this on my mind. I was thinking about some of the ways that we try to um, make God be okay with what we do. And admittedly, I think probably all of us have figured out by now, like, 
on the interstate, they have a, they have a speed limit, right? And it's, um, we might as well call I-65 the Autobahn, right? I mean, it's, it, it, the, the speed limit seems to just be a suggestion, and I get it. I mean, honestly, if you get on the interstate a lot of times, and if you try to go the speed limit, it's, it's a, a little bit more dangerous than going quicker because you get run over, right? Anybody kind of jive with me? You know what I'm talking about? Like, we know it's a law, and we know we ought not be breaking it, but whatever. So I just wanted to ask, how many of you have ever broken the speed limit on the interstate? See? See, I feel bad as a pastor because here's what happened. All right, I made half of, the half of you didn't raise your hand, and so I made half of you lie this morning. So I caused you to sin in church, right? The other half of you raised your hands, and you're like, hey, the pastor's like making us admit our sin before everybody. So there's like a no win in that, right? I mean, so um, let's get a little more personal. Why, why did you do that? Like, why would you, why would you break the, the speed limit? Why would I do that? Because we're convinced that it's okay. We're convinced that it's okay. I've told this story before, so I'll, I'll make it very quick, but this has been about 20 years ago, and um, I was, I, I, I ended up, in, I don't know how I do stuff like this, but I ended up in this situation. I was a youth minister at that time. This was probably 21, 22 years ago. I was a youth minister, and Sharon, is before, uh, it had to be over 22 years ago, it's like 22 years ago, because Jackson and Emma were not born yet. And so, as a youth minister, Sharon and I took two boys from our youth group, grown men now, um, and took them to an Alabama game. I'd gotten four tickets to one of the last Alabama games at Legion Field. And so, I take them to this game, and I had a parking pass, and... and parking pass. Long story short, I get in this lane, and I'm following some buses and some cars. I follow the car in front of me out. I get about three blocks down, and a, and a police officer jumps out in the intersection in front of me and starts to wave me down, like telling me to stop, telling me to stop. Well, me and my, and I'm in my early 20s at this time, I think, or mid-20s, and, and me and all of my infinite wisdom at that time, instead of stopping, I proceeded to just drive right around him and keep going. And Sharon is looking at me, she was like, that's bad. Like, you should not have done that. And I said, well, he was in my way. Like, he, like, I needed to go this way, and he didn't understand. Like, you know, he just jumped out in front of me. And so I get about three blocks down, and I get shut down like Motown. I mean, they, another police officer comes out, they shut me down. They make me park in some guy's yard. Um, two hours later, I'm sitting there. I've got two youth in my back. And some of y'all know them. Some of you are his, their parents. And, and so... They, they, were, they were laughing at me. They were like, this is the most hilarious thing we've ever seen, and I'm embarrassed. And Anyway, and, and so like two hours later, the, the police officer that I'd gone around three blocks back comes down, and, and he said, I'm giving you two tickets, one for disobeying a police officer and another for driving in a marked bus lane. And I thought, this is terrible. And so anyway, long story short, I ended up going, I, 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 I don't know why, but I, I, I went to, to traffic court and explained myself, and that's exactly how I felt. It was awful. And, and, um, and so anyway, they dropped, the, they dropped the ticket for disobeying a police officer. I explained. I said, look, I don't normally disobey police officers. I don't make a habit of it. It's not what I do. It just happened real quick, and it was just a bad judgment call. And uh, anyway, and then, and then I had no idea I was in a bus lane. But Anyway, and I had to go to driving school for that. And so that's my criminal record. I, you know, that was, my, that was like where I was, you know, bad one time. So anyway, the, the point of the story is I drove around that guy because I was convinced in that moment that it was okay. I was convinced that's what I need to do. That's what I'm going to do, and it's okay. And, and I had this mentality that they should be lax on that. They should understand that. Listen, when we have this mentality that God is lax that God is chill on stuff, that God is okay with what makes us comfortable or what makes us happy, then we don't understand God very well. I've had many instances over the years as a pastor and counseling people. Sometimes it's been with, with marriages um, where people will say, you know, they want a divorce or something like that, and there's no biblical precedent for that. And, they, and their reason is, I just want to be happy and surely God understands that see it with people people justifying things all the time maybe you've heard people say well it doesn't matter get this some people say well it doesn't matter what you believe 
as long as you're sincere in what you believe. And on the surface, that sounds sort of good, but being sincere is, is, while that's certainly a good thing, and while it may feel good, it doesn't necessarily always mean that it's true. So, so as we cut to the chase this morning, I think sometimes those things happen because we want to justify our own sin. Maybe when, it's, when someone's talking to, to, to a friend and, and they say, well, they want that person to be okay, and they say, well, that person's a good person. Or, or that person's better than most people, so surely they're okay. But I want to tell you this morning, there are no good people. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can't pick and choose what you believe. Scripture says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think even Romans 3, 10 through 12 puts it even more precisely. It says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Boy, that'll make you feel good on a Sunday morning, won't it? So many people who claim Christianity, and, and many who may very well be Christians... That's not for me to decide, but so many don't have sound theology. They don't, they don't know what God's Word says, or they try to make it say what they want it to say, and, and they're only okay with and only believe parts that are comfortable for them. And you're like, well, you know, what do you mean? Well, I'm telling you that many pastors are doing it. Many churches are doing it. Many worship leaders, many people that speak in the name of the Lord are doing it. Many professing Christians are, are mixing truth with lies. And the Scripture says that it would, it'll, it'll be this way. I'm just telling you this morning, and this is what's on my heart, church. Listen, as believers, we've got to know what God's Word says. We've got to know what we believe, and, and that we've got to know that what we believe matches with what God's Word says. I mean, there, there's so many examples, and I've, I've, I've tried really hard over the years as, as a pastor not to be a, be a name caller or anything like that, but I think we need some, I think we need some awareness as believers. Um, I, I mean, the list, we could spend a whole Sunday talking about different people that, that claim the name of Christ, and certainly some of them may very well be Christians, but, but, but there's some very bad theology out there. I mean, there's, there's, an, there's an instance I, I know um, a, a good example would be someone like, like Lauren Daigle. M many popular Christian songs. M very well, maybe a strong, you know, strong believer. But when she, was, when she was asked very precisely about homosexuality, she said she didn't know if God's Word ever addressed it. Wasn't sure, if it, wasn't sure about that. She said, she, she Verbatim said, I can't honestly answer on that in the sense of I have too many people that I love that are homosexual. I can't say one way or the other. I'm not God. When people ask questions like that, I say, well, read the Bible and find out for yourself. And when you find out, let me know because I'm learning too. But, but here's the deal. In the, in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18.22, it says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 says, Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the ungodly and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. I don't know how the Word of God doesn't address it. It very clearly does. I, I, read a, I read an article from a Messianic Jewish Christian who responded to her saying this. He was speaking on the importance of all of God's Word being truth, and he said that her stance, in stances like that, I would add, confuse people. He, here's what he said in response to this. He, to her just saying she wasn't sure about what God's Word said about it. He said, I don't claim to understand everything either. And it's a confusing issue, but God's Word does call it a sin, just as all sexual sin is called sin in the Bible. Even between opposite sexes, outside of God's order, it's sin. It's hard for me to say this because I don't want to hurt anybody else. I don't want to hurt anyone either. And honestly, I don't want to be rejected, but I can't reject the God I've known my whole life just for fame and acceptance. My prayer for everyone is that they would find wholeness through Jesus Christ and find the truth of God. 
And he went on to say, I'm not saying people will easily accept this. Some will and some won't. He even went on to tell her, he said, you will lose money if you take this stand for sure. Some will stop listening to your music, but you will be an example of both kindness and honest boldness to millions of people who are seeking truth and need to know truth. And he said, I want you to ask yourself, why has God raised you up? Remember that our awesome, loving Jesus said this. Look at this, Luke 9, 23 through 26. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. I want to tell you this morning, church, look, denying ourselves is not easy. It's easy to go with the world and the flow of the world and what what people want to hear and what people think is is right. But but I, I want to ask us, thousands of years from now, whose praise do we want? The praise of the world or the praise that comes from Jesus Christ? When, when, we, when we fail to call sin, sin, what God calls sins, we're being, we're being ashamed of his, his words. And that's the place that we're at in our, in our world today. What we believe matters. We must stand up on truth. And, and we're, we're dealing with it head on. I mean, just, just two, two weeks ago, several churches were removed from our Southern Baptist Convention because of embracing unbiblical stances on church leadership, covering up sexual misconduct. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We must stand on truth. I've seen it countless times as a pastor. I mean, pastors typically conduct funerals, and I've seen it many times someone passes away, and and a loved one will say, well, you know, he never did go to church much. She never did go to church much. They weren't too religious, but they're in a better place now. And I'm like, how do you know? How do you know if there was never any fruit? God God says, God God gives us some clear directives from the Scripture. I've heard people many times trying to justify sin and say, I know God's Word says this, but I'm going to do this. Because it, like we said, makes me happy or it makes me feel good. You know, I, I can't commit to this marriage anymore because I think God would rather me be happy. I'm not going to be there for my kids. My, my work's more important, but that's, you know, God wants me to, to, do, to do this or whatever it may be. It's just a little gossip. It's not really, it's not really going to hurt. That People need to know the, the truth about this or, or whatever it is. People, we, we justify things all the time. I mean, people go as far as to, to even say, well, you know, all religions are, are the same and as long as people are sincere. Do you know that only 37% of people in America believe that the Bible is the literal word of God? That means, that means 63% thinks that it's maybe a good, a good work and maybe it's just suggestions and a good way to live, but it's not the inerrant truth and word of God. 67% of people believe that there are multiple ways to get to heaven. And the list goes on. We, I mean, we've got, we've got uh, just this week, Elevation Church in North Carolina leaves the Southern Baptist Convention, and there's some very core biblical things that are off base with Elevation and theology. Saddleback, the largest Southern Baptist church, voted out of the convention because of some stances. We, I remember there, there, years back, there was a, a cult following for... A guy named Rob Bell, he, was, he, was, he had a college following, a lot of college age, you know, young 20s. I mean, just super talented guy, people, people following. Um, but he, uh, he began to, to teach that hell doesn't exist and that, that, that God is only about love. And, and certainly God is about love. And he, he wrote a... He, he, said that the Bible is just a book about what it means to be human, and then he began to be okay with homosexuality and all these kind of things. And I mean, just this just, just drift away from, from what is true. I mean, even here close to where we are, just in, in Warrior, Alabama, you have Robin Bullock and his wife, whose name is Robin Bullock. It's kind of different, but they, but they, they I mean, if you look at it, I mean, a, 
gobs of people following after this thing, gobs, gobs of money, buying up properties, claiming to have direct revelation from God, where God's spoken to him through a guitar, and tens of thousands of followers, and it's, I don't know, it's just, I'm just telling you, look, Christianity is not about people and money and having a following and fame and, 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 and claiming to be just some modern-day prophet. I'm telling you, Christianity is about Jesus Christ. And, it, and it's about the fact that we are sinners and we are, we are dead in our sin. And, and the only way we can cannot be dead anymore is through, is through Christ. It's through Jesus Christ. I mean... It's not a modern day thing. I mean, it was, it was happening in Scripture. If you go to 1 Kings, look at the Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 18, 17 through 21. You go back in thousands of years ago, ancient Israel, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I've not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. In other words, they were following idols. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah, said, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. I mean, pretty interesting scripture. Ahab was easily the worst, most ungodly king that Israel ever had. And Elijah calls him on it, and then he calls the people of Israel on it. And notice that he asked, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord's God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him, is basically what he said. There was a log it's a logical and useful question for us in, in, this morning. They wanted, they wanted to give some devotion to Yahweh God and give some devotion to Baal. But listen, it's very clear that the God of Israel, Yahweh, was not interested in divided devotion, and He's still not today. Our God is not interested in divided devotion. Elijah asked the people, how long will you limp between the two? There's an old saying that says, how long hop ye about upon two bowels? And basically, that's what it was. It's a metaphor taken from birds hopping from bow to bow, not knowing which one on which one to settle. And Elijah made it clear that there was a difference between worshiping idols and worshiping God, and the, and the truth still stands today. Maybe they had convinced themselves that it was okay to worship Baal. I mean, what's the difference? The only important thing is to have some kind of religion, right? And be sincere about it. Follow your heart. Whatever the God of your heart is has to be right. But Elijah knew that it couldn't be this way. You either served Baal or you served Yahweh. There was no uh, fence straddling. How, how long will you do this, Elijah asked. Let's get to the crux of it this morning. You know, when you think about it, basic spirituality is not controversial in our culture. I mean, there's not too many people that really, in general, have a problem with God, per se. You can talk about God all you want. The problem is, is when you bring Jesus Christ into it. When you begin to, to, to talk about Jesus Christ, people love things that are biblical. Things, people love help the poor. People love love other people. People love be generous. Forgive those who hurt you. I mean, I mean the teachings are, are phenomenal. So even if you hate Christianity, you, a lot of people love some of the components of it. But when you begin to say, well, you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ and the only way for salvation is through Jesus Christ to make an exclusive claim of Jesus is where people get offended. It's, it's where people get rattled and bent out of shape. In fact, it's, it's directly seen in Scripture. In John 14, 6, Thomas, one of the disciples, he asked Jesus, how do we, how do we know where, <clears throat> where we're going? And Jesus answered him and said, uh, and, he, and he said, uh, Basically, he said this, look at this, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You, you see it right there? That, that sets Christianity apart from all other religions. It's, it's the exclusive claim that there's no way to the Father except through Christ Jesus. And if we look at any other religion in the world, um, you may find some elements of truth in it, 
And you can find some things that look good in all of them, but nothing that's life-changing. I mean, just, 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 I thought this would be fairly interesting this morning. Just, just for a second. I mean, just, just think about it with me for a second. Let's give an example, maybe not too common around here, but here's an example, Buddhism. Buddhism, for example, has no God. Buddhism has no final type of existence. What a Buddhist would believe is they would believe in countless rebirths. We're reborn, and we're reborn, and we're reborn, and eventually that the cycle of rebirths ends. I mean, that's, what, that's where hope is in Buddhism. Hinduism. Very different. Hinduism has an impersonal God that's approached through deities and statues and idols. Very, very different type of thing. Buddhism and Hinduism do not offer forgiveness of sins or any kind of supernatural help. It's only karma. Uh, It's kind of like the game we played in Bible school the other night. You get what you get and don't pitch a fit. I mean, it, it, it it, it is what it is. If you take the Muslim faith, now Muslim worships Allah, a personal God. They believe that there's no secondary gods and there's a total ban on idols, unlike many of the other religions. You're standing in life, um, if you're a Muslim, with God, Allah, and and it depends on your religious devotion, but it's a very works-based mentality. New Age. It's popular in a lot of parts of the world, big in Hollywood. New Age believes that there is no personal God. They're going to believe most often in a higher consciousness, wanting to be maybe one with the cosmos or one with the universe. I don't even know what that means, but it means you just kind of go with the flow and you become a God, you're, you're kind of your own God kind of thing. Jehovah's Witnesses view Jesus as a prophet, but not the Savior. They change their theology as they feel led. Their headquarters are in Brooklyn, New York. They... They, they, they meet there, and that's where they decide what they believe. And when something doesn't come about, they just they, the prophecy doesn't happen, they change it. They believe that only 144,000 chosen Jehovah's Witnesses will reign with Christ in heaven, and the others will have earned their way there by works. They'll live in a paradise earth one day, a separate type deal. They do not believe in hell, but only complete annihilation for those whose works are not good enough. They believe the last days began in 1914, and they've... Missed it on several attempts to predict the end of the world, and that, like I said, they just keep changing the date. Mormons followed a claim to modern-day revelation from Joseph Smith in the early 1800s in America. He taught that the true church had been lost in the great apostasy after the ascension of Christ, and that he had been chosen by God to receive the new revelation and the restoration of the church. And he claims that he was visited by angels and the apostles, and that he received golden tablets with his new revelation, and that all happened in the United States of America. Mormons believe that Jesus is a separate being from God, the Father, and the Spirit, and that based on your works as a Mormon, that you can earn different levels and eternal rights. They believe that our God, who rules over earth, earned his way to be our God, and that if you're on that level one day, that you can have your own celestial wife and rule over your own planet one day. Listen, but Christianity has a personal God exposed to us through the love of God's Son, Jesus Christ. It's God saying, I created you, and you sinned, and you have fallen short, but I'm offering you, it's God saying, I'm doing this, I'm offering you forgiveness of sins, and that forgiveness is not based on your religious efforts or on something that somebody makes up, but I'm making a way for it to happen. It's based on the goodness and the grace of our God who created us and made us. So we have to acknowledge that there may be, um, there may be truth and elements of truth in different religions, but it's only Christianity that says the Word of God is the Word of God, and God is who He says He is, and God's made a way. And, and, and listen, this has nothing to do with Crosshaven Church or particular denomination. Jesus didn't come to restart a religion, but Jesus came to reveal the love of God to those who needed a Savior, and that's every one of us. Mark chapter 2, look at this, verses 16 and 17. It summarizes why Jesus came. In the scri- I love this. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw what he was eating was, that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And verse 17 says, And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who 
are sick. I mean, first of all, we see that the, the teachers of the law are questioning this, but what we see, and they're saying, these people are too dirty, they're too filthy, why would he eat with them? They're full of sin. And on hearing this, what did Jesus do? He said to them, and I love this with all my heart, he said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but who needs a doctor, church? It's the sick. He, he said, I've not come to call the righteous, but who did he come for? He came for sinners like me and you, and you and me. Scripture tells us that when a woman was caught in adultery and all the religious people said, stone her to death, the law, says that, and the law said that she deserved death. Jesus looked at them and he said, hey, whichever one of you has never sinned, then you be the first one to throw the stone. You remember that in Scripture? And then he looked at this broken woman and, and he said, go your way and sin no more. You're forgiven. You've got new life. I mean, consider, consider the ministry of Jesus and who he was and what he did. Think about it for a minute. Jesus, I mean, Jesus opened blind eyes. Jesus healed deaf ears. He caused the mute to speak. Jesus touched lepers and, and, and healed them. Those, those who no one would get near, he, he healed those people. Jesus turned water to wine. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes to feed 5,000 men and perhaps thousands more uh, women and children who were there that day. He walked on water. He raised the dead. And here's what's crazy. His critics didn't question the validity of the miracles. They just, they just wanted him to, it's weird, they just wanted him to stop. His critics just wanted him to stop. Stop, don't, don't do that. They actually saw the miracles and they wanted him to, to stop. But think about the gospel message. That God loved them and God loves you and he loves me. But he hates sin. He hates sin and that's why Jesus who was born of a virgin, he did not inherit the sin nature and earthly fa of an earthly father. He was without sin and that's why he could go to the cross. And he could become sin for us. I don't want you to miss the power of this this morning. On the cross, when creation was mocking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At that moment, when they had done their worst, they had beaten our Savior until He was unrecognizable. They drove stakes through His wrists and through His heels. They hung Him on an instrument of torture. And Jesus looks up to God, and He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And then he said, it's finished. In your hands I commit my spirit. The scripture says the earth went dark. The earth trembled. The centurion who had carried the cross of Jesus and was not a believer looked on and said, surely that man was the son of God. And three days later when the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty and Jesus was not there, and we as Christians believe that he was raised from the dead. Peter said it this way in Acts 3.15. He says, you killed the author of life. But some, listen, what did he say? Look at this, Acts 3.15. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. He, he said, what did he say? He said, I, I want everybody to see this this morning. Peter said, we are witnesses of this. To this we are witnesses. We are witnesses of of this miraculous, life-changing thing. It's so important because they were eyewitnesses that he, was, that he had once been dead, but now he was alive again. The skeptics and critics will say, well, the Roman soldiers probably could have stolen the body. The enemies of Christ would have loved to produce the dead body of Jesus to prove that he had not risen. And you could, we, could, we could go into that for a long time this morning about you know, conspiracy theories and, you know, could this be true or not? You know, but I think, well, how would, you know, how would they have ever pulled that off and kept it a secret? I mean, I'm just telling you that I'm going to bank my life on what the Scripture says, and it says that they were, they were witnesses. They saw it. What blows me away is there, there, was, there was one disciple who doubted. Doubting Tom, Thomas. Oh, Thomas was like, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. And Jesus shows up and says, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Touch my sides and stop doubting and just believe. And the only one that doubted, Thomas, became a great evangelist of God's word. And so Thomas, who doubted, eventually became the one who said, I'll never renounce my Savior. I mean, why would Jesus die for us like that? 
Why would Thomas say, I'll never renounce my Savior, the one that he had doubted so much earlier? Romans 3.22, look at this. It says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. And, and he, sa he says this, the, the Scripture says this in Romans 3.22, says that we're, we're, made by, we're made right with God by placing our faith where? In Jesus Christ. We're, that's how we're made right with God. We're made right with God by believing, to have faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Christianity really is, and I guess this is where I wanted to get this morning, Christianity really is Christ plus nothing. Nothing. Not, not Christ plus good works or Christ plus giving money. It's not... It's not making Christ be something He's not or changing His Word to fit our agenda or our lifestyle or trying to say, well, you know, surely God didn't mean some of this. I'll, I'll do this part, but I'm not sure about this part. It, it's, it's, it's not, it's, we can't take away from Christ and we can't add to it. It's not about making up our own belief system. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. What you believe matters. Look at this scripture. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. That's what Paul told Timothy. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season to rebuke, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming. This is where we are, church. And he was telling Timothy a long time ago, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and they'll wander off into myths. I just want to tell you this morning, what you believe matters. I thought about it, it's 4th of July weekend, it's Independence Day. I thought about what, you know, the, 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 uh, what it took for, our, for us to have a free nation and... Even more so, Corey mentioned it at the beginning of the service, what it takes for us to be free in Christ, to have salvation, to be changed. And I, th I thought a lot about so many people have defended our country, have, have stood and, and defended our country so that we can have the freedom we have. But I'm going to tell you, as believers, we need to be able to defend the Word of God. We need to know the Word better. John 8, 24 says, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. I think the invitation this morning is this. Lord, give us clear vision that we may know where to stand. That we would know what to stand for and what not to stand for. And it's got to all be biblically directed. If our worship band wants to come, we're going to sing one more song this morning before we go. And I... I know it was a message this morning without a lot of fill in the blanks, a lot of points, but a whole lot of scripture. But I think I just wanted to portray to us the importance of standing on the word of God and knowing that what we believe matters. We're living in a day where this teaching us that what's wrong is, is right and what's right is wrong. But we've got to know what's right and we've got to know what's wrong. Lord, give us clear vision for that. Would you pray with me? Lord, give us clear vision and clear understanding of what your word says and what your word teaches. Lord, give us a desire and a passion, Lord, for a strong faith. Lord, I pray over believers this morning, Lord, that we would not compromise on the truth, Lord, that we wouldn't make up our own gospel, but, Lord, that we would stand on the truth of your word. Lord, let your word be a light to our path, Lord, a lamp unto our feet. Lord, that we would, we would love your word. Lord, that we, would, that we would seek after your word. Lord, that we would, we would want your word. Lord, we're living in a world that is just making up its way without you. And it shouldn't surprise us. But Lord, as the church, as your people, we have, we have to be about you and not about the things of this world. So, Lord, this morning, our, our prayer of invitation is, is this, Lord, that you would convict believers, Lord, that you would revive us and you would grow us. And, Lord, if there are areas of our lives, Lord, that aren't honoring you and 
are not becoming of what a believer should be and what we should be pursuing, Lord, then you would give us strong conviction over that. I'm praying for spiritual growth, Lord, for us as believers. And Lord, I pray for the lost. Lord, if there's anyone here that's heard your word or, 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 or hears it, I know we, it's a holiday weekend and there's folks traveling. They may watch it online, maybe watch it now or watch it later, Lord, that if they hear this word today and they say, well, I, you know, I don't even know Jesus. Lord, we pray, we pray, Lord, that you would bring conviction on lives and, Lord, and, and, and that salvation would come. Lord, we want to be able to share the gospel with people that don't know it. So, Lord, we pray for those opportunities. Lord, again, thank you for our freedom. Thank you for freedom in Christ. And we pray all this in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior. Amen.